All right, so how's everyone doing tonight? Good. Good. I know it's St. Patrick's Day, so I'm happy that you guys all made it out. And uh, before you guys go out and drink your green beer, so thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Richie Contardesi, and I help web design business owners and WordPress freelancers automate project management to avoid wasted time. And tonight, I'm here to show you how to start from the initial contact all the way through to um, launching the website and getting things up and running and streamlining it as simple as possible. Here's how I'm going to do it. So we're going to start off talking about quickly through the sales process, uh, proposal and closing, how to effectively communicate with your client um, and avoid all of those annoying unnecessary emails, automate your project management, talk about the length of a project, how long it should be, and then of course at the end talk about how we can continue um, generating income. So here's the project process and the most important thing in the process is understanding that the shorter you can keep it the better. Um, today in today's world especially time is of the essence. So a lot of mistakes that people make, and I've made a ton of these, is thinking that the longer, the more time that I spend with clients, the longer I spend with them, the, the better it is and the better chance I have of, of gaining them as a client, and that is not the case. The, the idea is to um, find out what they want and need, provide them with a solution, and move on to getting the project started. So this is the project process that, um, that has worked the best. Now. When you first get them on the phone, the most important thing is the client. Client, 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 listen, listen, listen. A lot of mistakes that people make is when they get them on the phone, they're so excited at the service they provide, because I know you guys all in here are awesome, and you're so excited to talk about it that you forget to learn what they want and need. So the most important thing is to understand and learn what they, do they want, what do they need, and really dive into it and ask as many questions as possible. Once you know what they want and need, then you can provide them with a solution. So um, not the service that you provide necessarily, but the solution to their problem. And you're going to use your service and wrap it around and warp it however you like to make sure that you have provided a solution to their problem. Um, most important thing here is to, to not be scared of pricing on the initial call. Um, you might get on the phone with a client and they might be excited about a project that they have and uh, you're so excited that you've, you've provided them a solution and you've hung up the phone with them. And you have no idea um, if they can afford your greatness. So be prepared and talk about pricing. I know it's really difficult on the first call because you just found out what they needed want and it's difficult to come up with a price quote um, but it's important to at least give them a range an idea an hourly estimate however you go about doing it to avoid the I've sent them a proposal and I've never heard back and most of the time it's because they saw your price and ran away that's the first thing they look at when they look at a proposal so um, I highly suggest and believe to do not send a proposal until you've discussed price with them um, the last thing I want to talk about here on this initial call is that this is a two-sided interview. You're interviewing them and I know you want them as a client, you maybe need a client, but to really understand that it goes both ways. You can have a client that can give you a ton of trouble and walking away is okay. And that's something that you'll see as we discuss here later on in the presentation. Alright, so you're on the phone with them, you've discovered what they wanted, what they need, you've provided them an awesome solution and you've discussed price. The next thing is to do the proposal. Everybody here does it differently. There's no wrong way or right way to do it. There's best practices, but the most important is that you have a solution to their problem, a timeline, and you provide them with the price. Now when we get, after they've seen the proposal, you have a follow-up call with them. Do not hang up the phone with them unless you have a follow-up call. If you can close the sale on the initial call, do so. Try not to walk away from that. Um, uh, the biggest mistake here is you have the proposal in front of them is you're selling your solution to their problem and uh, you mix that with closing. Selling is not closing, closing is not selling. Once you've sold your solution, the next thing to do is to 
ask for the sale. Um, so make sure that you go ahead and ask for the scale. I have two uh, asterisks here for the word scripts. Um, I know you guys are all uh, either technical or WordPress freelancers and uh, I understand that, but learning how to use a script will help you a lot, especially in this stage after you get on the phone with them with the proposal so you don't lose them. Um, there's tons of free information out there on the web on scripts on selling and closing and closes um, that will help you through that. This way you can focus all of your time on WordPress and not on closing. So we want to automate the project management process. We want to avoid tons of extra collaboration between yourself and the client or yourself, your client, and if you have a team. Um, and this is the six step system that I've created over the past few years that has been extremely successful for myself and for some of the clients that I've worked with. Um, we're gonna start off here with step one, which is research and a design form. So this is an example of a design form that I use um, with my clients and I understand that Everyone has their own strategy of pulling design out of their clients. This is uh, a very difficult thing to do and people do it different. Uh, the, the best way that I've seen to go about it is to find out from the client three sites that they love. Doesn't have to be in their industry, um, but three sites that they really like, love, and what do they like about it most and what don't they like about the site? Because I'm sure there's gonna be some things that they don't like. So if you have a client that says, you're telling me to provide you with three sites that I like? I mean, I, 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 I can't do that, I don't know. Um, th there's tons of sites out there where you can go to, and after doing the great discovery phase that you guys have already done, you can provide them with three to five sites for them to look through and choose from and fill out this form. So <clears throat> it's important here to get the most information from them in regards to what they like about design and what they don't like, colors, um, those type of things is really important in this stage. And you guys can create your own um, system around it or form around it, per se. Um, but the, the simple thing here is to not have um, a ton of emails going back and forth, but to get it all into one form that goes directly to you or your team. All right, so step two, uh, design mockups. So, some of you might use templates. Um, I was assuming probably the majority use it, or excuse me, creates custom themes. Um, so if that's the case, you guys are probably working in Photoshop to create your designs. So whether you send them two mockups or three mockups, it doesn't matter. But the main thing is that you um, have provided them mockups, and to provide them instruction on feedback of those mockups. So. Everybody sends their client mockups and cannot wait for the feedback, but it takes two weeks because they are not sure. Uh, their business means a lot to them or their new entrepreneurship adventure means a lot to them and they're very confused uh, as to where to go. So what I highly suggest and I'm gonna talk about throughout this process is making videos explaining to them how to provide feedback to you. Because how many times do you get feedback that you're looking at and you're like, how am I supposed to accommodate this feedback? So you need to uh, time. So every time you're talking to a, asking them the same email of your screen using Camtasia, you can record and what I found best on this feedback now, before you guys say, I'm about to ask my client to make an on-screen video for me, that sounds crazy. Actually, it's not. And I've had one client in the past three years balk at this. And that's probably when I walked away. So, um, it's, it's very rare they'll do it because if you explain to them properly, it will give you the best chance to get down to that perfect design and avoid numerous revisions after you've already developed the custom theme. So, you've created the video on how to provide you feedback. The video is gonna illustrate to them using a Jing video how to um, illustrate which part of the designs they like, which parts of the designs they don't like, so you can get down to creating that final design that they're going to love. Um, that jumps into step three. So you've provided them that final design, you've nailed it down, you've sent it to them. This is when we're going to go through the site map or the hierarchy of the website. So um, what I have them do is, again, I've created an on-screen video that instructs them on how to 
to list out what they want on the top of the site, so home, about, contact, etc. cetera. Um, and it's a video explaining how to do that. If your client's unsure, then you can provide them an example, walk through it with them. Either way, we want to speed up this process and get through it. Once you have the hierarchy of the website, go ahead and create the custom theme. So you have the final design and the hierarchy. Go ahead and create the custom theme. That brings us here to step four. And this is when we talk about the content and images. Um, everybody is going to do this differently. Every, some of you might use copywriters. Some of you might purchase your images for your clients. Um, so this can go a couple different ways. But um, let's just say that your client is providing their own images and their own content. Um, this form basically illustrates to explain to a client how to add content to a Word document using um, bold for the title of the page, the content of the page, and then attach images separately. And throughout that content, they can actually name the image uh, and put it in the content on that Word doc so you know where to put the image. So now you've received one file through a form that has a Word document and a compressed file with zip file with images. You have the Word document, you know exactly where to put the content on every single page, and you know exactly where to put the image inside that content on every single page. Now, I understand it's not going to work perfectly every time with every client. It's just not going to happen. But uh, for the most part, you can get uh, most of it nailed down, and you can eliminate a ton of going back and forth with establishing content and where it goes. So this streamlines that pretty quickly. After this step, it depends on how you guys handle revisions. I know some of you guys might uh, charge extra hourly for revisions if you're flat rate, or you might say one round of revisions through each step or for your process. Um, the most important thing here uh, is to make sure when you're getting the design changes with it, you're getting the design changes, you add in the content images, and then you can jump and push the client right into step five, which is getting their login credentials for their hosting account if you're not hosting it, excuse me, their domain credentials so you can point the domain. So we've walked them through and we can now push the client into launching the site. So th we're talking about practical business websites here. So if it's more complex, obviously, there might be some different steps that generation or brochure website. This is an, an easy way to get through that last step where it uh, can kind of linger the most. So the final step here is structural SEO. And sometimes, depending on the client, this actually might go before step five. If the client has a, a website that has very strong domain authority, you're going to want to do your 301 redirects. And um, so you just want to be careful of that. Um, and some of you might also outsource to a um, SEO freelancer or an SEO company to handle do it yourself. Um, you know, you, he, we talked about uh, Yoast and some of the WordPress plugins for SEO where you can easily add in their meta, metadata. Um, okay, so we've got through all of the steps, the site's launched. Let's talk about, there's two sides of the house, right? There's you guys as the freelancers and there's the client. So it, it takes a team in order to, to make this happen and, and, and the time it goes back especially to the, to the discovery phase that I talked about when we're talking to the client and, um, and, and that two-sided interview um, where you know when to walk away. So when I look here at ugly, three plus months for a 15 to 25 page brochure or lead generation website, um, I'm sure that makes some of you guys cringe and, and it happens to all of us. Um, so, so the goal here is to, to eliminate that. And, um, and that's, and that's due heavily on the client feedback, choosing clients, and also pushing them through a um, six-step system. Best case scenario, we've got three to four weeks. If we have a client who's um, the immediately you send them their, their forms, um, they fill them out and get right back to you. They provide you feedback right away. Um, that's an awesome timeline to shoot on, especially if you're on a fixed price and you're trying to get that, that final launch payment. I have another asterisk here at the very bottom. Track your time. Um, this will really help you as you move through this process and develop it for yourself. Um, track your time. Know how much time you're spending on per, per, per client. Uh, it really matters and it'll help you 
more efficiently gather the right data from the analytics of that tracking to establish a better system for yourself. So I highly recommend doing that. All right, so we've got the site launched and a lot of times freelancers will say, um, you know, I've launched the site, great, next job, next job, next job. And that's great, but wouldn't it be nice to know that you finished a big job and you could take a month off? Wouldn't that be nice? I think reoccurring revenue is, is an awesome thing. I'm sure all of you can agree. And it's something that a lot of people don't focus on. So as a freelancer and, and being talented with for clients fairly quickly. And so there's a, there's a couple ways that you can go about doing this. And one, hosting providers or servers, or I'm not sure how you guys go about doing it. Um, but providing hosting to your clients for WordPress is a great idea. Also, and you're not hosting them. Things happen. Plugins aren't updated, themes aren't updated, and you're in a situation where you're managing plugins and themes. So I highly suggest working out a white label hosting, and there's a bunch of them out there if you research that, um, or having your own equipment. Now, for support, there's three ways that I actually go about doing it and that I've seen other companies go about doing it and it works well. And the basic management kind of covers what I originally talked about with themes, keeping WordPress updated, plugins updated, because as you can know, if it doesn't, websites can easily get hacked. Now I found a, <clears throat> there's a ton of them out there, but I found one to be exceptional. And it's free off the bat, but it has paid ex uh, extensions, and that's WordPress main, WP main. Um, and that allows you to automatically update themes, plugins, and WordPress when necessary. You can also add in an extension for virus scans. So you can basically charge $59 a month for hosting on your site, depending on how much traffic they're getting, and automate the process of managing the website. That's a great way of generating reve of reoccurring revenue. Multiple ways you can go about these packages. Um, you can go by hours, you can go by number of tickets. I've seen it three or four different ways. Um, but this is the way I go about it. And basically, I, I provide two different packages, and one of them has uh, 25 hours, and one of them has 50 hours. Uh, I do it this way because um, it's easiest for um, my team and the way we go about doing it. Uh, we use a ticket out there, and there's a clear client submit any revisions, edits, page additions, or whatever it may be, uh, through your ticketing portal, it goes to you or your team if you have one, and you can quickly just go in and take care of it. So I've actually seen WordPress freelancers who did WordPress um, building sites actually turn into um, managing um, support like this. Just because if you have you know, 100 or 150 clients on this, um, you can really do some, some good damage. So that's where we kind of jump in with the ticketing portal just to keep your email clean. Um, the most important thing here is fast turnaround. So quicker turnaround, customer service, obviously the better it's gonna be. The last thing I wanna talk about here is referrals. So you've done an awesome website, you, you're hosting them, you're supporting them, and um, it's time to ask for a referral. And a lot of people don't ask for referrals because they feel like they're going to ruin the relationship with that client. But you're absolutely not if you do it right. Do not. I would highly suggest not calling a client and saying, can I please have a referral? Uh, there's a method to this madness. And how I go about doing it and how I've seen it done best is to call your client and ask them to rate your service on a scale from 1 to 10. So you could say, you know, Mr. Prospect, I really enjoyed working with you. If you had to rate my service and what I provided you on a scale from one to 10, how would you do so? And more than likely, if they're this far, they're going to rate you somewhere between an eight and a 10, hopefully a nine or a 10. That's a good thing. And that's where it gives you the opening to walk in and ask for a referral. Again, we're not gonna ask for a referral. We're gonna ask for one to two names. So do you, do you have, do you know of maybe one or two people that could, that I could help, just like I've helped you? And 
nine out of 10 times, they're gonna think for a minute or two and, and they're gonna come back and they're gonna say, you know what, actually, and they're gonna provide you a name, hopefully two or maybe even three. So you've got three names now and you're gonna say, well, Mr. Prospect, how can I contact them? What's the best way to contact them? What can you provide me? And they'll provide you a name or a number. If you've gotten this far, you might as well go to the next step. And the next step is to, <laughs> so you, <laughs> the next step, you've, excuse me guys. So you've got, you, you've got the one to two names, you've got the contact information. The next step is to ask for the introduction. So you can ask them in two ways. One, to send them an email and have them CC you on it as an introduction. I've done this and it's worked. And I've asked them, would you mind giving them a call right now? And it worked. So don't, uh, don't count that out. So here, just briefly, I just want to run through some of the tools that we talked about today. Um, Jing, it's a very lightweight, it's a free tool. Um, and it's, it's, it's very simple to explain to your clients. I actually have a page on my site um, on how to use Jing. If you do end up recommending this to your clients, um, feel free to copy and paste. I've created a whole step-by-step -step list for how to download it and how to use it. I've also created an on-screen video on, on explaining to clients how to use it if you guys want to make one for yourself. But um, the tool has saved my life. Rhino Sport and Zendesk, we talked about submitting tickets. Let's clear the inbox. Um, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I cannot stand when I have a client that sends me four to six emails all with the same topic, um, discussing the same stuff. So let's get everything into a support portal and let's let our clients know that we want everything in one shot. WP Main, great way to go about um, uh, automating your management of websites. Um, so like I said, you can automate and uh, update all of your websites at one time. Gravity Forms is great for your online forms. If you want to embed them, if you want to send them an email, um, there's a few ways you could do it. They're very easy to set up. Toggle. So the Toggle is a, it's a free service actually you can use to manage your time. So let's, uh, so understand your analytics, how much hours you work a day. This will help you expedite and speed up your process. Basecamp. Basecamp, I'm sure every single person in this room has heard of it. Um, and it's an excellent way to make sure that you understand where every client is on a calendar view and you know uh, what step they're on and, and to push them through to the next step so you're not waiting for a month between feedback. The last one I put on here is a little different and it's actually something that will help you to manage your tasks on a day-to-day -day basic. So I know this is a little out of the ordinary, but I have to say this tool is amazing. And uh, basically it will give you the ability to see exactly what you have for that day and which one of your clients you need to push to that next step. So highly recommended. So, um, I'll open it up for questions. How do you handle uh, progress payments? Do you do it by those six stages, or how do you generally like to do payments? So how do I like to do payments? I like to do payments. I do 50% up front and 50% for step five. So when I send an email to them, I have an automated email that goes out. You know, this is step five video. Here's your step five form. Here's your step five launch payment. Step five was Right before launching the site? Exactly. That's when they give you their domain credentials. How do you handle the code solutions? Do you have any kind of support system where you could uh, roll back? Absolutely. And we yeah. actually use it. So, I mean, you're talking about through from my team? Well, theme or even the plugin, if you want to find plugin. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we definitely, yeah. I think, I think what he's saying is what type of, um, do we use Git to push and pull code at any time, right, between team members? Is that? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Just in case there's any type of, you know, if we push something, we need to pull it back or anything like that, yeah. Yep. We're dealing with proposals. 
lot of times I won't put enough information or too little information to on the client. Is there any like uh, any tips you have on that or how we can get what the course should be or what the strategy should look? I'm so glad you asked that question. That is an awesome question. The proposal question, and what he's asking is, should it be super in depth, or should it be, or how in depth does it have to be? And my answer to you is as simple as possible. Um, unless you're working with a big corporation, do not create a five-page proposal. Do not do that. Um, the idea here is to make it as simple as possible for the business owner. The first thing that they're going to do is they're going to look at price. So as long as you have the solution to, your, to their problem, your process of how you're going to solve that problem, cost, and timeline, that's all you need. That's all you need. And, just, and, and you're going to get really excited on the part where you talk about your service. Just, just really focus on the value of your service that you're providing to them and just be as swift as possible. Um, I, I, literally, I used to do um, proposals on a page on my website that I'd send them to. And I found that sending proposals in an email has the best conversion rate. And I've actually tracked it through Yesware. So, yep. How do you deal with difficult client and did it happen that you walked away from a project, for instance? It's a great question. And yes, I've walked away from two projects before. Um, so if you have a client and you're, you're on one of the steps and you're, you're hogging down for information, um, there comes a point in time where it's not worth your time, right? I mean, we're, you guys are all really good at what you do. Why waste your time? Because when you get into that three plus range, your, your time is so much more valuable probably than that check's coming. So, um, I mean, if you're, if you're in step four, I mean, I would let it sit and, you know, pound on them every single day. Um, but that's just me. Um, I've never had a client go longer than that, so I, I don't really know. But I, I would, I would just continue, 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 continue. And at some point in time, I mean, it, it could happen that they go out of business, or they're just—it's an entrepreneur, and you're building a site for them, and they just—they don't have the money, and they're not into it anymore. I mean, at that point in time, it's not worth your time, and you know, your time is more valuable than that. So, yep. I noticed you jumped straight to doing a sales call. Do you do any kind of method to qualify leads before being on the phone with them? Yeah, great question. So the initial call was the discovery call, I guess you could say. Um, so are you are you are you referring to like if you're using AdWords and you get a, a lead calling in or any, any lead? Like if I get a referral, they have to fill out a form, even if it comes from a friend, just because I don't want to waste each other's time. Like if they have, if they're a yoga studio with a fifty dollar budget, right. I'm gonna refer them to someone else. Right, right. Okay, so you're saying you have a form? Yeah, like a qualifying form. If, and I send it, and if they don't fill it out, and then they have to add me on LinkedIn in the top. And if they don't do either of those, then I don't take it. Yeah, that's, that's one step ahead. Yeah. That's one step ahead. Yeah, so that's, okay. that's, that's pretty awesome. I'm actually impressed. Yep. How do you deal with project creep? I'm sorry? How do you deal with project creep? Project what? Creep. The creeping of the project where it expands. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. That is an awesome question. I'm sorry? I'll repeat the question for the video. Yeah, so he's asking if you're in the middle of a project and the scope completely expands. Um, and you're referring to more like functionality, right? Like if they're asking for, and is this something that you can't quickly solve with a plugin? Right. Where they're asking where you have an initial pro proposal, right? And then they start asking for other functionalities and so forth. And what happens is sometimes it becomes insidious in the sense that when you start with one thing and it keeps expanding. Right. Right. That's, That's very common. It's very common. Right. So uh, I would, if I was in that situation, I would actually just call the client and sit down and say, "Hey, look, this is the this is the product that we have right now." Here is a solution that I can provide to that problem. This is what it's going to cost. So we have our project we're working on. You have an additional project. Here's the solution. And here's how it's going to cost. Yep. What do you like about Rhino support? What do I like about Rhino support? Yeah. So I've used Rhino support and I've used Zendesk. I'm actually right. using both of them right now for okay. two separate teams. Rhino support to me is just so much easier. To, to walk through, you know, if you have open, a pending, and a closed, 
And it just seems like you, when you can add notes and it's, Zendesk to me has way too many features. I feel like it's for maybe bigger corporations. Yeah. Um, but that's really my take on the difference between Rhino and Zendesk. Uh, for your video on like giving design feedback, what guidelines do you have for your clients to make sure the feedback's good? Yeah, great question. So when I send them, I, I send three Photoshop mockups, and then I have a video basically explaining to them, and there's actually a video for every step, but for that particular video, I'm explaining to them on how to use Jing and how to, exp you know, on, the, on your website, when you're looking at the, the uh, design, say, you know, I really like the header here, but I wish the menu was on the left side, or and I kind of just walk them through like how to describe your design because a lot of times you'll be on the phone with the client trying to get design revisions and you're trying to write down, you're trying to turn like what she's looking at into words and it it's a disaster and then you send them the photo, the new design and they're like, what is this? So, yep. So I'm new to the whole uh, freelance. Okay. Uh, track your time, you know, how much time you're, you're spending, and know your hourly rate. So what, what are you worth? That's the most important thing here. Um, and then when, you ha when, you, when you're on that discovery call and you're quickly gathering all the wants and needs that they have, you can basically put an idea of an hourly rate or an hourly um, estimate and then that's when you can give them a range price because this happened to me and um, I, I, it was the worst thing that ever happened, and I, I got on a discovery call, uh, didn't talk about pricing, spent five hours on a proposal uh, for a large job, and got back on the phone with her, and she had a $1,000 budget. So um, know, you know, know your hourly rate, I would say. I used fixed prices, um, but I also have a team. Um, if you're a freelancer, um, if you're going to use a fixed price, go with it. Because a lot of people will use a fixed price, and then you talk to somebody, and they're like, "Yeah, I, you know, I'm the, oh, you know, I'm a multi-million-dollar investor, and all of a sudden your price triples." So just, you know, I would say just stick with it. Uh, yeah, I just want to comment on, on that. You're, what you charge the client really needs to speak to the problem that you're solving right. for them. Uh, and the uh, metaphor that I use is building an IKEA desk. Uh, the, the, if you were to build two IKEA desks, the first one you build is probably going to take you about 10 times as long as, as the second one, especially if you build the second one right after right. You've, you've built the, 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 the first one. So you might solve a problem for a client in a half an hour because in the past six months, you've put in 100 hours researching some, something. Right. You know, or, or, the, or the reverse, you might not know what you're doing. And if you might be very experienced and normally worth a lot, but you get asked to do something that you haven't done before, and it's going to take you a lot more. It's really not fair to be charging your normal. Either that, or, the first time you do or something. if it's something that if you're the type of person where you want to consistently keep learning, then you take that job. Or you might say, eh, you know, maybe you walk away from it. But I completely agree with what you're saying. Yep. What's your um, average type of client? Like, what what does all of this pertain to? Size business, small business, large business. Where are you? Great question. So typically small business. Um, occasionally I have medium-sized businesses. Normally the medium-sized businesses already have a site and I provide them with support. Uh, but mostly what I work with is e-commerce and small businesses and generally for lead generation. So do you find that they're able to make videos you know, to accommodate your requests? Yeah, I'd say, do that. Right. And, and I'd say about 95% of the time. You'd be surprised. I mean, when I first started doing it, I, I was like, I'm just going to do it and walk away if they will not use Jane because I am so tired of trying to talk design that I was like, they must use Jane or I'm not working with them. And it's, it's, it's been a lifesaver. So. Do they have to be 
they roll your, your eyes at you and the my dogs? I mean, yeah, at first, usually. And I, I mean, I'm, we're talking, you know, I've worked with some entrepreneurs that don't know how to turn on a computer. Yeah. So it's, it was tough, but I talked them through it, and I made really good instructions on how to do it. And like I said, you guys can go to my site and copy and paste it and use it, and it's worked well. So, so you do quite a bit of training, pre-training, before they can actually get the, right, the main thing is with that, she's asking, do I do a lot of pre-training with every client? Yes, one time. I've done it one time, and then I give it to every client. I don't do it with every single client. That's why I'm highly suggesting making videos. You make an on-screen video and you have a system, your clients can go through the system and you don't have to explain to every single client the same thing through every step. So, yep. So I noticed that your, your package is $250 for hosting, right? And it includes 25 hours. Mm -hmm. So that's like $10 an hour, right? And assuming like every ticket takes you 10 to 15 minutes to manage. That's not really long. Right. I mean, not, not just you know, to like bring the ticket into your system, figure out what you write, get it together, find what needs to be fixed. Like, how are, we, how are you paying people? Like, what, are they remote like, workers? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And I have one file as manager. Okay, all right. Okay. And everybody's just wrote So that's the key. Yep. Um, just to go back to the question back here about. Um, Charging. Um, I'm a little new to, I've been doing WordPress a bit for a couple of years, just starting to do some custom things. I've been doing static websites for a long time. Okay. I find it very, very difficult to estimate the amount of time with the learning curve if I'm using a pre done thing. Because some of them are very complicated. You go in there trying to figure out functionality and you can spend weeks trying to get it to look how you. To look, or of course, in a static site, you could have done it in you know, an hour. Um, so, do you think that the custom things are a better solution? So, you have that predictability, or have, you know, yeah. a hard thing to work out? It really is, and it, it, there's like a transition phase, right? So, if you're working with templates, um, there actually are a couple really good ones out there that you can almost do anything with. Um, Avada. Salient. I think those are two that will really pretty much, if you know WordPress, you can pretty much do anything. Um, but if you're transitioning into doing custom themes, then you know, then you make that transition. But um, if you're wanting to stick with templates, there there are templates where you can do tons with. I would highly suggest not allowing clients to pick your template and then using that template. That's a huge mistake. I think that's kind of what you're referring to, right? Well, yeah, a little bit. I guess you figure out which ones you like to work with, and then Don't ask what your you're you're using, you're basically, basically learning a new, almost like a new technology every time you use a different template. So I would highly suggest, you know, l figuring out what design they want. If you can use Photoshop, create a, a mock-up, and then pick a theme, if, if template, if you're gonna use a template, or use the same template that can do anything, yeah. What, what were the names of the templates you gave? Oh, Avada and Salient. It's been a while, but I think those two are really customizable. A B A D A. I think a lot of us are facing the same problem with the not knowing how to estimate, you know, how yeah. long a project will take, and you seem to be a proponent of just getting a set price. Yep. Uh, you, you speak a little bit more about why that's advantageous to have a set price from the beginning versus. Yeah, so I'm a little bit different because I have a, a, a team in place. Um, but because of the process and the, how I push clients through that process, I'm able to have a set price because I can pretty much know how long it's going to take. So, I mean, as a freelancer, though, I think it, it still goes back to um, kind of what, what he said is it really just having the solution to the problem and figuring out how long it's going to take you to solve that problem. Um, if you wanted to go fixed price, you can. Um, but again, I just, I would focus on, I would overestimate too. Like if you think it's going to take you 50 hours and you're $100 an hour, you know, you might want to charge like 7,000 or something like that because there's always going to be, you just got to be, if you're, if you're going at a fixed rate, 
and you don't have a system, you're going to spend so much more time than you could ever predict on a project. So I would say fixed rate's great when you have a system. Hourly rate's great when you don't. Does that, does that answer your question? Or yeah. Is there another way you could word it? I mean, just in general, like, would you, have you found, have you done testing or analyzed your, your data about whether, you know, getting a range of a certain amount is leading to less sales than just giving a set price or something like that? Or you know, in your experience, has that been more advantageous to stick with one number? Set price. Yeah. I've closed more deals with set price. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, how do you And then you start building, and then change requests. Come so do you put like a maximum number inside the contract, or what's your strategy? Yes, great question. So no, I don't put a maximum number of change requests. I only allow change requests once through each step. So when I'm talking to a client and I'm telling them about my service, I can easily say unlimited revisions, because technically it is. But because every step has a place for them to submit the revisions, by the time you get to three or four, it's exactly what they want. Now you're probably thinking, I've had a lot of clients that said this is exactly what I want and then the next day completely changed their mind. But if they're already past you know, that step and they say, you know, I don't want the steam, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's where you'd have to have a sit down conversation. I, I don't think that's ever happened. Okay, but just the tiny things, then the client says, oh, make the button a little bit bigger, and, yeah. and you say yes, because it's just this tiny little thing. Yep. And then the, the things just come in. That's why you can only let them submit it one time. Yeah. And you tell them, look, before they start, when you, know, you tell them there's a place for you to put your revisions through each step, and you just let them know. And as you're creating this process, you'll create a checklist of how to talk to the client and how to explain it. But the main thing is, they get that one spot, and they have to submit it in that spot. Um, and if they don't, they have to wait till the next round, and that'll that'll limit the the I want the button blue, and then I want the header green, and then I want the header red, and then I want the header blue, and then I want the header. You know what I mean? Like so that that kind of a, and they get only so many chances to change that header. You know what I mean? Before you pop. You know. Yep. Organizations and increasingly I, I have to document. I used to do the proposals, now with the projects they figure they want some sort of contract, and so now like an MSA and statement of work. Is that, how do you handle those uh, elements of the project? I just want to move through those, but I don't want to have them come back to bite me. Right, right. So, your, so your question is how do I handle if I have a client that needs like an NDA and an MSA? And yeah, do you, after the proposal, once they accept it, you have to, to sometimes do they need more documentation from you, like a statement of work and a master service agreement, or do you just go off the proposal? Yeah, I, I mean, rarely ever do I get into contracts. Um, if the job is 10+, plus, 10,000 plus, then we usually put some contracts in place, but typically everything's documented and done through email, so, um, but if you have a client that that is obviously requesting them and it's mandatory, then, um, you know, I would just, just do it, so. Yep. Do you include the post-launch service uh, options in the proposal? I'm sorry? Do you include the post-launch um, support options in the proposal? So, great yeah. question. At the very, very bottom of the proposal, I, I put an optional, an optional service for support if they want it. Because really, when you're talking to them, the main thing they're so excited about is getting their website. You know, the last thing you want to do is start selling them on something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're selling, we're stop selling, and then we're closing, and then once the site's done, then we're selling. Yeah. So you, you definitely do not want to sell close, sell close before you even start. Yep. Are you typically working on new sites? And or do you have a separate process for redesign? Same. Same process for both. Yep. What's an average hourly rate? An average hourly rate? Yeah. 
a good question. I mean, it, it really depends on location and years of experience, right? So if you're in New York City and you have 10 plus years of experience, you're going to be 100 plus, 150, 200. Uh, I mean, if you're starting out in Wisconsin, maybe 15 an hour. I mean, it's really for New York. I mean, there's also going to be an expectation of what uh, a certain size business is willing to pay. So even if you have 10 years experience, you know this guy is also going to pay so much. So that you're going to set a rate, you know, for that level of business. So for like so, so what you're saying, you're going to set your hourly rate based on the size of the business. I'm just curious to know uh, because I mean, yeah, all right, you're great. You have 10 hours of experience and all sorts of other experience. You're probably worth 500 an hour, maybe. But your client or the average small business owner is not going to pay that. No. So that's, yeah. No. That may be the market. It's not a good client. I mean, if you're, if you're really good and you're 200 plus, you know, you're, you're not working with small businesses. No, no. So what are small businesses uh, expecting to pay? Good question. So anywhere, I would say from 50 an hour to 75 an hour is probably a, a solid range or a little more. And that's for freelancer, one yeah. person. I mean, but it, it, this so for is... You, for you, you have a team. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of people you know, to consider. Mm -hmm. So if you set an hourly rate, you have to factor in and you've got to prove it for mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a little different. I mean, for a freelancer, it's definitely different because you're you're the self-employed. You're, you're actually doing the work. Right. So it's a, it's a, you structure it so much differently. But I, I would say for a freelancer, you're probably in somewhere in that range. I mean, I just... Do you do full production services, audio, video, photography? Do you do all of that? No. No. Yep. Okay. I just want to recommend a book to everyone. It's called uh, Breaking the Time Barrier, and it's from the owner who made Fresh Books. It's about value-based pricing. We don't charge by the hour. We do value-based pricing. So if we get a client, or if we get them, if they do $10,000 a month it's, uh, for one product, like we work with a company that sells industrial equipment, if we can get them one more sale a month, we're making them 120000 a year. So when you tell them 15000 for a site, they cut your check the next day. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's, that's how you have to think about it. If you go hourly, you're competing with people in India, and um, you're going to lose. So you also shouldn't be punished for efficiency, um, so for like our team, like our number one thing is we use hardest time to track our efficiency. It's not for us to track what I'm paying them by the hour. It's to track how good we are at your job. Right. And if we're really good at our job, some work that like other teams take eight hours to do, we do in one. But we still charge thousand dollars because why should we punish for that? And the clients understand that if you make them money. Yep. Like you know, we do. We have some clients are giving us like they started at forty thousand a year, now they're eighty thousand a year on retainer because we make them probably 10 times that. So, if you don't make the money, they don't care how cheap you are. Sorry? It, and if you don't make them yeah. enough money, they don't care how cheap you are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, and the thing is too, it's like, if you think of it as if you're, look, I think that because the internet is like such a non-tangible thing, it doesn't get as much respect, but you would never like call your mechanic and talk to him for a half hour about your car problem. You know, like you just tell him, I have these issues, and he says, bring it into the shop. It could be up to $10,000 if it's a, this thing, and it could be the lowest $500 we put up on the blocks. Because that's, you know, they have a minimum for what they do. So, re breaking the time barrier, I recommend to everyone. But yeah, like, you should not be charging hourly unless you're, like, in India. Right. So, yeah. What was the name of the book? Breaking the Time Barrier. Any other questions? Okay. Well, Thank you. Thank you for coming. So we uh, we have the space for another forty minutes or so. Yes. So if you want, we could just take general questions. A lot of times we just do that. You guys ask you you guys ask questions. I try to answer that. As long as they're not personal, <laughs> we're good to go. So if you want to do that, that's great. If you don't want to do that, and you want to leave, that's fine too. You've already been checked in. You're not logged as a no-show. So 
we're all excited that you're here. But I'm happy to answer some questions um, oh, about WordPress. Some people keep it getting uh, sad without your name. Okay, so you got it. Okay. So when you guys came out, if you guys want to do that, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. So let me know. Um, we're here to help. So, I'm there. Thoughts? You want to hang out? You guys hang around? Ask questions? 